Hello, everybody. Welcome to part two on our reading of the Magdalene Manuscript. I will include last week's part one, which was a brief introduction down in the description box below in case you missed it. Now, I want to remind everybody that with the Magdalene Manuscript, we're dealing with something that was channeled by the authors of this book. Now, I have skimmed a little bit ahead just to see what we had in store. And I have had some off-camera conversations with people who have also read this book. A lot of the people that I have had conversations with regarding this book are also under the same impression that I am. Even though I was raised in a Presbyterian church and I was raised to believe that the man we know as Jesus Christ was crucified, I actually don't believe now in my journey that that crucifixion actually happened. I have reasons to believe this because of some evidence I have been sent by a military insider. Unfortunately, at this point, I can't share that information. But also, logically speaking, as we go deeper and deeper and deeper into this great awakening, which we know is spiritual, why would our creator, the creator of good, demand a human sacrifice? The only God that demands a human sacrifice is Lucifer. In fact, these are the activities that were happening down on those islands or in that camp site up in Northern California. I believe that Tartaria existed. And with Tartaria, I do believe it is my opinion that the a thousand years of peace already happened in which Magdalene and Joshua co-reigned as the Christ, both of them carrying that Christ consciousness into the world. Of course, we all have access to that Christ consciousness. The Kundalini rising is our own individual Christ consciousness. I personally believe that the apocalypse was the fall of Atlantis. And again, the a thousand years of peace, Tartaria. And right now we are in the final battle, which is Gog and Magog. With that being said, I am under the belief that the powers that be have rewritten our timeline to try to convince us that the man we know as Joshua or Jesus Christ was crucified and therefore we must take the blood and the body, which is a form of cannibalism. I believe that they understand how human consciousness works. And so if they can rewrite history and create this false timeline, then the real timeline disappears, disappears from our consciousness. And therefore they have a better opportunity of hijacking what's destined to happen, which is our earth transcending to fourth density positive from third density to a fourth density negative planet. Of course, these are all just my opinions. With that being said, I am familiar with a term called confirmation biased. Now in this manuscript that allegedly was translated from Magdalene herself, we are going to get into the crucifixion of Yahshua. Do I believe that Magdalene was being channeled? I actually do believe she was being channeled. There's a lot in this that is very much in alignment with my own re factual research of who Magdalene really was. However, if it is ingrained in our psyche that Yahshua was crucified, then of course the channeler is going to hear that information regardless of whether that information was given or not. That's why we call it confirmation bias. So before we get into this manuscript, I did want to make that known that there are going to be some things in this that I absolutely agree with that absolutely back my research and my opinions. But there's going to be stuff in this manuscript that I think is completely false. And I don't think that the person who translated this manuscript, if they did mishear it, did it nefariously. I think it's just the conditioning of our consciousness to accept one storyline as fact, when in fact, it's not fact. I hope that makes sense. And again, please take everything with a grain of salt. Of course, I love to see debate and conversation in the comment section. Just please remember to be respectful. You can have debate with people and conversation with people without calling them names. We're better than that. So just remember that going forward. All right. So let's get into the first part of this channeled message. Now, with one, I was raised in the understanding of magic. My father was from Mesopotamia and my mother from Egypt. Before I was born, she prayed to Isis to bless her with a child. I am that child. I was known as Mary Magdalene. Now, Mesopotamia, okay, maybe, but we do know that her father was actually Greek, which could be a part of that. You know, um, her mother, 
100% Mary Magdalene was from Egypt. She was not from Magdala. That is 100% true. Her mother, what we know of her mother is her mother was actually a priestess in the priestesshood of Isis as well. And I'm super, super, super interested in Magdalene's own mother because we know the name Magdalene comes from her mother's line. And it does have to do with the priestesshood of Isis. We know that her mother was Nordic looking, blonde hair, blue eyes, and her father was Greek. And so a lot of the original paintings that people made of Mary Magdalene closer to her life show her with blonde, blondish reddish hair light eyes that is accurate to how we know that she probably looked she was not middle eastern she was not hebrew she was not jewish all right when i was 12 years old i was sent to study with a secret sisterhood of initiates under the wings of isis i was trained in the secrets of egypt the alchemies of horus and the sexual magic of the isis cult when I met who you call Yahshua, I had passed all my initiations. I had prepared for the meeting with him by the well. The gospel recounts me as a prostitute. For all initiates of my order, we wore a gold arm bracelet that was a serpent. And it was understood that we practiced sexual magic. And in the eyes of the Hebrews, we were whores. So yes, yeah, she's separating herself from the Hebrews because she was not her nor Yahshua or Jewish. When I saw Yahshua and, I, and our eyes met, I understood that we had been destined for each other. What I'm about to tell you has not been known, except by those who were there with me. Many legends about, about as to what happened, but for me, it is a story of deepest love. That Yahshua had a vision of the world does not touch me. My story is a love story. Many people followed Yahshua. And the opportunity for us to be alone together were very few. It is not written in the Gospels, for no one knew, only the closest to us. Before Yahshua went into the Garden of Gethsemane, we conceived a child, and her name was to be Sarah. We actually know that they had five children, uh, Mary Magdalene and Yahshua. Sarah, or as what we know, the Gospel of Sarah, which is one of the missing books of the Bible. Apparently, it's under the Vatican. I don't think anybody has a copy of it. Allegedly, talks about this time we're living in now is the gospel of Sarah Two, The story I'm about to tell sounds fantastical. I remember the reeds of Marie de la Mar, although then of course it was not called that. It is a place where our boat came ashore. Sarah was quite young, not quite one year old. I was torn by grief and amazement. And she's referring to the South of France. Now I have talked about many a times that if you're looking at the actual map of the way the Americas was, it does appear that what was considered Gaul back in those days was actually Canada. Now we can see this as the one continent where all of the continents were together and how they could have been merged together as one. And that's why there's so much stuff on both continents. I don't believe that the continents split as late or as long time ago as they say they split. So that's just something to consider. I was there when Yahshua was crucified. I saw him in the tomb and wrapped him and his mother beside me. I will forever remember the smell of mirth. That was one of the ointments we used. Uh, Yahshua appeared to me in his luminous light. I could not believe my eyes. And so I touched his wounds. The disciples were jealous that he had come to me first. It was strange to have my beloved transported to another realm, another world, Why I and our daughter crossed the Mediterranean alone. We were no longer safe and had to leave Egypt, for that is where we had gone. Now, again, yes, we know she actually had five children. When we crossed into the shores of what was to become France, it was all wilderness. We were met by a priestess of the cult of Isis. We were headed north to the protection of the Druids, for Isis had spoken to them, and they had heard the call to protect her daughter, Sarah. And so we headed north to another great body of water and crossed over into what would become England. Now, um, the Druids, it's interesting she talks about the Druids because we know that they come from a group called the Kentuckians. So I think there's been some confusion. I'm not referring to the state of Kentucky. I'm talking about the Kentuckians. Kentucky was a planet, another planet just like ours, that was also annihilated by this Draco bunch. And the Kentuckians, according to the Cassiopeian board, the Kentuckians were brought to this planet during the time of Atlantis. And they were actually brought to this planet in the area that we call Kiev in the Ukraine, which is another very interesting current event connection. 
The Kentuckians are what we would call Nordic people. So the Druids, the Celts, um, as I've said before, her mother, uh, Mary Magdalene's mother was Nordic or Kentuckian in heritage. We're all galactically, we all have galactic lineage. That's the 12 tribes of Israel. They're not earth-based tribes, but they're galactic tribes. And the Kentuckians were the Nordic. So the fact that the Druids would be ushered in to help them does make sense to me because that was her mother's people. And there we were secreted up into the most sacred heart of the Druids, to the Tor and to Glastonbury. Although we were safer than we had been in Israel or Egypt, the Roman influence extended up into England as well, and we were hidden. Now, I personally don't believe the Roman Empire ever existed. I believe that the ruins we see from the Roman Empire are actually the ruins of Atlantis. I could be wrong about that, but we have to remember that time has been manipulated and they have created a narrative that's not true. Our history is his story. It's a bunch of lies. But once again, this could be what this person was picking up and channeling because that was the history that this person channeling had been taught. And so therefore there is confirmation bias. When your brain doesn't know another alternative or timeline, it's going to naturally cling to the timeline that it knows, which is the timeline that we were all taught by this group, this cabal in all of our churches, all of our universities, everything. So we lived in this area for many years, and Sarah wedded a man whose heirs would become the Templar Knights, and I went north into Wales and lived by the sea for the rest of my days. I will say this, that in those years when I lived alone by the sea, Joshua would often visit. Of course, it was not like before, for his body was more energy than flesh, more light, but still it was extraordinary to be with him again. When I died, he was there and took me into what some call heaven, but it's just a place in the soul. I agree with that. Three, I begin my story at the well, for in many ways, that is when my life truly began. All the years previous were pre preparation for this meeting. That morning, I knew something was stirring, a kind of excitement, a trembling in the arms and legs before I'd even met him. I was already at the well when he arrived. I had already sunk my jar into the shaft and he helped me raise it. Some of the apostles saw my gold serpent bracelet and assumed me to be a whore and were aghast that the master would help such a one. But this did not touch me. I was in another world, transported by the eyes of Yahshua. When our eyes met, it was as if I was looking into all of eternity, and I knew that he was the one that I had been prepared for. And so did he. So we kind of touched on this a little bit in Megan Watterson's book and the previous um, book we read through in the series where we talked about the concept of twin flames. And this gets into Plato's symposium and other theories. Now, what a twin flame is, basically, it's when the soul comes to a, a particular point of its own evolution that it splits into two, a divine feminine and a divine masculine. Twin flames are actually very, very rare. And a lot of people had speculated that the 144,000 as spoken about in Revelation are actually twin flames. Now, twin flame journeys are very complicated journeys because you are literally dealing with your literal other half. Now, with that being said, as Taylor Moon often says, it does not mean that you alone are not enough. I have a twin. I My soul is in another human as well, a, a divine masculine. It's going to be a divine feminine and divine masculine. But that does not mean that I myself am not whole within myself. And that does not mean that the divine masculine of my divine feminine, divine feminine is not whole within himself too. Absolutely, we are. And in fact, for most twin flame unions to work and be productive, both the individuals have to do their own work on themselves. Most twin flame unions do not come into union until much later on in life. They're not people you, your high school sweethearts with, because you have to go on a separate journey and so does your other half. Now, the thing about the twin flame too, she talks about the eyes of Yahshua. From my research and what I understand, we all know that the eyes are the windows to the soul. But from what I understand, most people will recognize their twin flame by their eyes. There's something very, very different about the eyes of your twin. Does it matter? Any, just looking in them, you're going to be struck by the fact that 
that is you looking back at you in a weird kind of way. So the fact that she brings up the eyes is very significant. Now, also with romantic twin flame unions, there can be twin flame unions that are not romantic. That's rare. That is rare. But sometimes the soul will agree just to work with each other and not be romantic. Most are romantic, though. Um, it's like you're putting yourself back together with your other half. With that being said, in the act of putting yourself back together, it apparently shifts the vibration of the world. So when twin flame unions come together in the act of intimacy, it will vibrationally shift the world. All right. Because these are old souls, your powerful souls that are finally connecting together. I hope that makes sense. So what she's talking about here definitely does back a lot of the research I've done from other sources. All right. I continued at the fringes of those who followed him. And in the evening, we would go off together. Not every evening, for he was constantly sought after. I, who was trained in the alchemies of Horus and the sex magic of Isis, was considered to be highly advanced by my teachers. Yet the first time in Yashua's arms, I was tr a trembling woman. And I had to fight to find the central pathway through my desire to the highest throne, for that was my training. Her central pathway is Shashumna. I've talked about that in a lot of my yoga videos. That's the, the pathway that runs up the spine where Kundalini travels up. It's the central access of the body. That's what she's speaking about here. Yashua and I, using the techniques that I had been trained in, as well as the methods he had learned in Egypt, were able to, uh, were able to charge his ka, his energy body, with greater light and energy forces so that he could more easily work with those who came to him. And so it was. So basically Mary Magdalene, the feminine divine feminine of the Christ activated Yahshua. Now, from what I understand, that is the role of the feminine in a divine, uh, divine twin flame union. The feminine is the one who activates before the union uh, comes together physically, usually the feminine is the one that activates a tower moment too for the um, for both of them um, to to cut for to have things in their lives kind of fall to the wayside in order for them to be a union. With that being said, I have found that for this 100, 144,000 at this time, the powers that be are doing everything they can to try to keep those unions from uniting because there is a, such a high vibrational frequency that um, will change things for, for the world. So that's what she's talking about. She was able to activate Yahshua's Kundalini, basically, because that's the role of the divine feminine. All right. And I still find it ironic that the gospels report that I was at the well when Yahshua arrived. But those many nights when Yahshua and I were alone, he came to my well to draw from me the powers of Isis to build and strengthen himself. There's an energy. It's funny too with twin flames. I know that twin flames can also have the ability of like giving each other energy when they're not like telepathically, like can sit and like give each other energy when need be. Um, even when they're like on the other side of the world, uh, that's something a twin flame can actually do is actually give. And as far as consent goes, there's like a loophole sometimes with twin flames. Sometimes one twin can actually kind of help the other because they do share a soul. And so they are experiencing a lot of the same emotions and the same feelings, even if their lives are totally different because they are sh sharing that soul experience. I hope that makes sense. I know that's super psychedelic, but I hope it makes sense. All right, four. When I stand in time now, looking at all of this as if it were a dream and yet so still vividly clear, my heart trembles as I recount the story as if it were yesterday. The first night with Yahshua is sketched within my mind as clear as the skies over Jerusalem. After I've been able to pass through the desire of myself as a woman and ascend the path into spiritual alchemy in which I was trained, I could see Yahshua's spirit form already luminous, already bright with light. A dove was above his head, golden rays of light poured forth from it. The sills of Solomon, of Hathor, of Isis, of Anubius and Osiris were his spirit form. They were signs that he had passed through these initiations. There were other symbols I did not understand for they were from cultures I had no knowledge of or training it. But of the Egyptian sills of which I knew he was on the path of the high god Horus. And a lot of people do believe that Yahshua was an incarnate of Horus as well, that they were the same soul. 
but he had not yet passed through his death initiation. And I knew in my trembling heart that that is why I had been drawn to him at this time to fortify his soul with the powers of Isis and the cosmic mother so that he could pass through the dark portal and attain the Horus. That night, after we made love and wielded and blended our spirit bodies together, the action of alchemy having begun between us, Yahshua drifted off to sleep. As I held him in my arms, I felt a turning within me, a desire to protect him, a desire to be always with him, and the knowledge, like the edge of a cold knife, that we would be parted by forces of greater than my desire. Five. The church would have you believe that I was a whore, but I tell you now that the church is the whore. Agreed. For she would have you believe that a woman is tainted and that sexual passions between a man and a woman are evil. Yet it is here in the magnetics of passion that the womb of ascension is created. The secret of secrets was known by all the initiatives of Isis. And yet I have never imagined that I would be the one to bring it into its fullest expression in the union with such a one as Yahshua. For me, this journey is of my spirit and heart. But for those who wish to know the physical journey after Yahshua's crucifixion, I and his mother, Mary, Joseph, his 12-year-old son named Aaron, and two other young women set off from northern Egypt. Our course took us ironically east before we could turn westward, and we had to stop for provisions along the way as our boat was very small. Our path took us to Malta and the tiny island of Audish, from there to Sardinia, and to the tip of what is now known as Canique Terra, finally landing at Saint Marie de la Mar and making our trek northward through Rien la Chateau in northern France and across the channel into what is now England. We settled in Glastonbury for several years until Sarah was 12. Upon her 12th birthday, we set off for the place among the reeds where we had landed. There, as close to Egypt as was safe for us to go, I initiated my daughter into the cult of Isis and bathed her in the waters of the Mediterranean in accordance with the teachings I have been given. When we returned to Glastonbury, until Yahshua and my daughter Sarah wedded at age 16, she married into a well-known family whose heirs became the Templars, although at the time the Knights Templar did not exist. The family bloodline through Sarah would be carried into the Templars themselves. When Sarah was married and secured in her new life, I headed north for Wells and lived in a small stone cottage by the sea for the rest of my days, which again goes against what people believe is the cave in the south of France, where people worship a skull they believed belonged to Mary Magdalene, which I covered in the last section where, or the last book, where I said no, because the skull was obviously that of a Hebrew woman. And we know that Mary Magdalene was not Hebrew. Behind my cottage, there was a stream that came out of a hill, and I would sit there many days. For there was a time when the stream split in two, and the two streams followed each other, and then one veered off to the left and one to the right. And I would sit there in between them, thinking about the stream of my life and the stream of Yahshua's, how for a while our lives, how for a while our lives flowed together and then parted. Six, I will forever remember the first time Yahshua came to me after his resurrection. It was a new moon and the sky was clear. A light fog hung over the heathers and everything was silver from the light of the moon and the stars. I saw a figure approaching me on the windy trail that led to my cottage. Ironically, I had just gone outside to draw water from the well and there he was. He looked the same, yet with a radiance, unmistakable. My eyes filled with tears, my heart trembled. I ran to him and stopping short, I remembered his words to me right after the resurrection. Do not touch me, he said then, for I have not ascended to the Father. Oh, how I, as an initiate of Isis, have yearned all these years to set the record straight. What did he mean by these words? For Christians have inherited only a part of the truth. The greater part of the truth is hidden within the mysteries of the Great Mother. And because the church sought to disenfranchise women and all that is feminine, it sealed away this truth. And the truth has to do with the Ka body itself. And we learned as initiates to call the etheric double or spiritual twin for the Ka body when charged with enough energy and vitality looks like the physical body. But unlike the physical body, the Ka body is not made of flesh, but of energy itself, energy and light. And so when Yahshua came to me after his resurrection, he was in his Ka, but it had not been stabilized yet for he had not gone to the father meaning into the great spirit of his own soul. So before he could do this, he had to pass the portal of death and travel through the underworld of his own being. 
He did this for two reasons, I understand it. The first one was, as a master soul, to do such a thing brings great power to the call. And the second reason was to cut a passage through death itself so that others could follow and pass through the dark world more easily by following the trail of his light. And so the first night when we were rejoined, I feel it now, still vividly clear and strong, my heart filled with joy at being with him again. He came to me that night just before midnight and left just before dawn. In those hours we lay together, our Ka bodies interconnecting yet again, no need for talk. Our communication was telepathic, and without the physical act of sex, the serpent power within, within him joined the serpent power within me and climbed upward along the sacred paths in our spines to the throne of the crowns of our heads, sending me into sheer ecstasy and bliss. And this is how it was for many years. He would come to me this way several times each year. Sometimes we would speak, most of the time it was in union. So again, that central path, the serpent, the kundalini goes up the spine into the upper part of the energy cycles. I asked him where he went in these times when we were not together. He said that he had gone to many sacred places throughout the earth and he had met with many different people. He said he was laying a path of light. During one of his visits, I asked him to explain to me this rather strange concept. He drew a circle onto the dirt floor of my cottage and then what I recognized as two triangles intersecting to make the seal of Solomon to become the star of David. He said that there had been many lands that we in this part of the world did not have knowledge of. Many of these lands had pointed corresponding to the points of the seal of Solomon. By, by going to these areas, he was ensuring that his work would take a deeper rooting into the soul of the world. And I kind of disagree with this because the star of David has a very, actually very nefarious background but again the person channeling this was just taking the information that they had been taught while trying to channel other information so i don't blame the channeler for possibly getting some things wrong seven of all the times that he visited the time that stands out the strongest in this time he came was when sarah had come to visit she had just become pregnant and wished to see me for my blessing and so i was thrilled to see her and her traveling companions she had sent word of her coming through the druids, but their word got to me only one day before her arrival. She stayed with me for three days, and on the second night, Yahshua appeared. I don't know if you can appreciate how odd it, it was, for Sarah had never met her father, nor Yahshua his daughter, and yet here they met for the first time. And her father's body had returned to the elements in a flash of light in his resurrection, and so now he was in his Ka body, which emitted a kind of unmistakable light. Both of them were moved, Sarah to tears and Yahshua to great pathos. They, sent an, they spent an hour together, just themselves, walking outside. I do not know what they talked about, but from the time they began until the time that they ended, the sky was filled with falling stars. Before Yahshua had left that evening, just before dawn, on him, as was his way, he placed his hands over Sarah's stomach and blessed the child. Sarah left me the next day, filled with an unmistakable sense of peace. And so I have told you that I wish to say about my life as a mother, and now I will return to my story as an initiate to the alchemies of Horus unto the secrets of Isis. <laughs>